Hello, and welcome to another Uncomplication. My guest, Lewis Daniels, who I have to tell you guys, of all the people that I've, I've found and listened to and, and uh, been educated by, Lewis is on the top of that mountain. Uh, he has a, a, a deep background in money management and trading and investing in Bitcoin. He was in since the early, early days. And he is a remarkably uh, clear and concise communicator of these ideas that are fundamental to what the market is actually doing. Once you strip away all of the marketing, all of the noise, all of the influencers, all of the clowns that are, I'm sorry to say, trying to separate you from your money. Uh, yeah, I hope that you do invest the next hour and a half. I know that's long, but of all the things that you could do for yourself in the crypto space, this conversation I think is among the, the best use of your time. So without further ado, um, sit back and enjoy this conversation with Lewis Daniels. Cheers. In a space that seems like an echo chamber of bad information and hopium and just like nonsense. Sometimes I just get angry at what I'm seeing. Yeah. And so it was a relief last year to come across, um, yeah, at least one person in the space who was giving good information that was was rooted in logic and sanity. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that. And I, I think, you know, for me personally, it, it, it just comes down to experience. And I think, as you say, in terms of an echo chamber, you know, everybody wants Bitcoin to go up because, you know, they, they've bought at 50K, they've bought at 60K, and, and, and therefore they still carry in the red bags. I, I think looking back and, you know, from getting involved in the space, the one thing I can see, I guess, kind of going back from where I started with this, I was in the right place at the right time. You know, that, that wasn't kind of skill. That was just, you know, as you say, being in the kind of investment world. It was just something that kind of popped up as an opportunity. I think putting my trading hat on, it wasn't really until the kind of 2017 kind of time frame and towards the end of 2017 that I guess both sides of my role, so from the investment world and the kind of money management, that side of it was almost an indicator for what was about to come, mm. the kind of conversations with other venture capitalists the kind of LPs that kind of finance venture capital firms, the sentiment was pretty much, you know, if Bitcoin's going up, we'll invest in blockchain-based technologies. And that was really kind of fascinating to have these conversations outside of the trading world. And then you come in and see the charts, and the charts really weren't saying that much at the time. You know, it was still that kind of hobbyist type thing. And I think it was the early stage before that real big ramp that took us obviously all the way to 65K. I think the next thing for me that I've talked about, and I know I posted one of these things. So during my kind of transition from kind of money management to kind of doing things at my own free will, a lot of restrictions, obviously, in terms of what you kind of put out there content wise. I, I think it was the reaccumulation on the way up to 65K mm. that really made me realize, oh shit, you know, this is, this is something, this is actually going to become institutionalized overall. But I think the misconception for many traders, especially if you're new to the space or you're new to trading full stop, is that, you know, big players come in and the price has to go up. And I think this is the biggest problem. You know, I mean, I keep saying on my streams that ultimately, you know, BlackRock's not going to come in and make a bunch of retail traders rich. You know, that's not where BlackRock make their money. That's not where these other guys, you know, in terms of ETFs come in to, you know, to make retail to rich, you know, so that, that's the biggest point for me. And I think that's kind of where I stand with it, you know, is a lot of people, maybe they watch my streams and they kind of go, oh, you know, you're a perma bay. You know, my, my average entry at the moment is $200, you know, so it's, there's no reason for me to buy. I guess the reality is when you know what you know and what you're looking for, it's kind of obvious to see the bigger picture. Hmm. And I think as a long time trader, the bigger picture is what you're after. So, you know, I guess this idea, this goes back to November last year. And the one kind of catchphrase, I guess, that I've been kind of known for recently over the last couple of months is that nothing's changed. 
And uh, I keep saying the same thing, you know, nothing's changed. The reason for that is since doing this kind of analysis, you know, back in 2021, in terms of the, uh, the cycle, the move, the next steps, nothing's changed in terms of what I'm seeing, you know, what I've already said, what I've already stated out there. So I think this particular post, what I'll do is I'll see if I can come down. So kind of step by step, really. As I said, right, just now, the, let me see if I can make this a bit bigger. The first, you know, the first kind of rally in the first run, right? This was, you know, this was hobbyists, right? This was people that were in kind of either in the know, they were playing with it. You know, this is where you've got your, you know, your 10,000 Bitcoin pizza. You know, th this is the kind of place. And this was the kind of the Wild West then because a lot of projects have kind of come and gone. And, you know, sometimes, like I said, just being in the right place, the right time. As we kind of ramped up this first rally, right, so up to, like I said, the end of 2017, what I was actually seeing in the investment world was, you know, Bitcoin was almost an indicator for other projects, other technologies. You know, if you come to a VC with a blockchain, you know, buzzword in you were pitch deck, mm -hmm. if Bitcoin went up, you were getting financing, you know, that, that was kind of the way that it was working. So it wasn't really until this particular point that I was kind of free of my contracts and free of my obligations to actually start posting. So, you know, at this particular point, you know, I've been long since down here, we kind of got to this stage and I was kind of able to make this you know, public. Hmm. So obviously kind of posting along here. Now at this point, right, there was no real analysis involved, right? This was kind of, you know, I could see a future for the technology and much like a lot of the other VCs, a lot of the other people already in at this particular point. This was, you know, we've come up, you, you, you can't really do an Elliott wave count on something like this at this stage, right? So for me, when I was seeing this, it was, you know, we, we're long. As we then kind of started to move away from this position, it was this particular post in this particular area. So this was January 23rd, 2021. Mm -hmm. And what I found fascinating was if you were to do an Elliott count from this low, you know, zero up to this high, back down to the low, you could actually start to see fractal moves inside, giving us extensions to the level. Hmm. Right? So as we get to this reaccumulation, you know, I'm starting to switch from a an investor to, you know, actually this is something that I can trade. So, you know, for me, a lot of my my sells at this particular point was not sells as in going short, but selling coins that I bought back down here. And you know, as a professional trader, this is, you know, this is the whole point. This is kind of, this is how you win. You know, you don't want to be keeping coins and, and hoping that we go up. You want to be taking profits kind of along the way. So, you know, you look at this and I think it, it was the kind of mind boggling aspect that Bitcoin was transitioning in front of your eyes. You know, I hadn't been able to see this with something like gold or oil. You know, I, I'm not that old. So in the grand scheme of things, it was so impressive to see the transition of an instrument from that plaything to a professional tool. Yeah. And then I think from there, you know, we step up to the kind of to the top really. And, you know, as you say about, you know, for months I was posting, you know, white cough distribution. I was talking about this in the March prior to the drop. So you can see my first call here at the start of the red box. And the general idea was that we'd move down to A, we'd come back B, we'd drop down C, we'd go up D, and we'd finish in this zone for a fall, right? So at this particular point, this was where the combining Elliott waves as well as the Wyckoff distribution was, well, you know, we kind of starting to see the patterns, we starting to see kind of the obvious. Now, this first move down to the A, you know, perfectly to the level, you know, you, this wasn't just the, oh, well, I think, what actually happened then was the area of liquidity. We actually swept two and a half thousand dollars above the area that I thought we might get, right? So this is where the first time you could actually see the hopium in the market. And this was the first time that I saw, you know, from a realistic perspective, what Twitter, you know, what social media in general was actually starting to kind of scream about it was you know bitcoin's going to a million dollars 
and it was two and a half thousand dollars over the liquidity run hmm. into this one. Right? Yeah, just pausing there real quick. I mean, this is where I cut my teeth in the market, so to speak. And I remember yeah. not just from lines on a chart, but I remember emotionally what that felt like. Yeah. And I remember as a novice, you know, retail investor, trader, whatever you want to call it, I was literally emptying my kid's college saving fund. I was using my home equity line of credit. I was considering selling my cars. I would have sold fucking organs because I believed, <laughs> you know, the narrative so strongly. So, you know, yeah. the effect, the the cultural phenomenon that this was you know, it's hard to be inside of that and then to step outside of that picture when you've got your kid's college savings fund riding on, you know, whether yeah. it goes up or down or, I mean, the number that I always had in my mind in this period was like, it's going to, I think it was like two, two, 220 or 250. Like it's going to 250. It doesn't matter what happens because yeah. it's going to 250. You know, all the models predict it. So anyway, I just want to bring that up because I, you know, a lot of people that I still interact with, they're very much on the roller coaster, you know, like you're, you're the engineer looking at the schematic of the roller coaster. Um, and I think even to this day, the reason why people have a hard time with, you know, even seeing that this was a sweep above liquidity, you know, like this is a mechanical function of a marketplace making money, but, but the, the emotion, the, the, the feeling of being that, you know, lamb to the slaughter is that, you know, you're seeing your hopes and dreams, you know, lifted up high and then just dropped. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, from what you've just said there, I think, you know, this is this is really fascinating. This is the bit that I enjoy with kind of the market commentary. Mm. You know, I, I guess seeing people enter the market and have these crazy expectations. You know, when you see a rally of, you know, $65,000, you kind of think to yourself, now how much is enough? You know, where, where does that enough come to? And I think when I saw the reaccumulation happen down, you know, at 35, 36K level, it wasn't really a point of exiting. You know, my money was made on the way up, right? And, you know, yeah, granted, I wish now looking back at the current price action, I'd kept hold of all my coins. But when is enough? Hmm. And I think that's kind of the difference between the retail gamble and the professional, you know, money-making aspect of trading. You know, mm -hmm. and and I think this is the bit that a lot of people kind of miss the concept of. You know, it, it's it's a lottery punt rather than I'll make money today, and I'll make money tomorrow, and I'll make money the day after, and the day after, and the week after, and the month after. And I think this is the big difference to to what we're seeing, you know, right now. And and I think this kind of cult like mentality. It's so easy, and it, it it's been so easy to capture you know obvious moves based on you know t Twitter tweeting, you know ultimately hey everybody's long you know as a professional uh, you know trader as as someone like BlackRock someone like myself you know this game is easy this is you know shooting fish in a barrel you mm -hmm. know this this is straightforward so. I, I think the transition for me, and like I said, this is where it kind of got interesting, is if you actually look at this image, right, and you go $2,500 from the top of the box to the overall price, what's really fascinating is as we drop down for what I've deemed as the C, the C is actually $2,500, exactly the same as the overshoot mm -hmm. on B. So the schematic was playing itself out near enough perfect apart from the bit of hopium. Right. And what happens then is we come back. Now, again, D is exactly the same there back to the underside of the box. They're two and a half thousand, two and a half thousand, two and a half thousand, two and a half thousand. Right. This for me was not a hey, this is a random move. This is orchestrated. And orchestrating a move like this is what the big boys do well. So to see this transition, you know, in March 2021 from mm. we've had a reaccumulation, we've now got a distribution. And the distribution is textbook. It was like incredible. It yeah. was absolutely amazing to see. Now, at this particular point, obviously, I'm getting a lot of hate comments. Oh, you're wrong. Bitcoin's going to 200K. Bitcoin's going to a million dollars. And the price drops down to, you know, a pretty decent target level that was predetermined, you know, back in March. 
we hit this level in, you know, what, May, June, we play around this level, we grab the liquidity and we go. So for me, I think the overall, you know, the overall position is not really caring where we go. It's almost now the, the enjoyment mm. of watching it play out as you'd expect in terms of these textbook type moves. And I think this is the, you know, this is the cool bit for me. Yeah. To being able to watch it. And I, and I envy you that a little bit, because again, like, I just remember what that time period felt like, because, you know, uh, learning about Wyckoff was sort of the seeing behind the, the curtain, right? Like seeing the man behind the curtain. And I yeah. remember the day that, you know, I, I, I knew this information. I knew it was true. It went against all of these hopes and dreams that I had and the mythology of Bitcoin that I had been promoting, you know, to friends, family, anyone who would listen um, and I remember the day that I like sold, you know, all of pretty much all my crypto because I knew it was going down. Like I knew that this was a, a distribution and, you know, yeah. very uh, impulsive retail type um, move. You know, I wasn't looking at my entries and exits and what my plan was. I was just riding the waves, but I knew like this thing's going down and to, and to actually sell at the top was like one of the hardest things I did. I sat there for probably five hours with my finger on various buttons to like sell, you know, different altcoins and things. And I felt like, it, you know, with my friends in the space, they all thought I was crazy. It was like a sacrilege to, you know, diamond hands and all of that kind of mentality. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know why I feel like the need to drive that point home. It's it's like the difference between seeing. Yeah, seeing the framework and then being like the mouse in the maze. And yeah. so, yeah, let's um let's keep going here. I love this uh this this post is kind of a a framework for our conversation. So, you know, so, yeah, all so, time all time highs and Yeah, and I and I think this is the bit like I said this 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 is the transition that, you know, kind of watching the reaccumulation, watching the drop. The drop kind of happened in like I said two and a half thousand dollars each way. You know, that's nothing in Bitcoin terms. And, you know, we kind of land into the pocket and then we start the rally away. Now, you know, for me, again, what was really interesting here was I kind of started, you know, what we were doing in terms of our educational online education at kind of this point, right? And, and I, I think what was really fun for me at this particular stage was a lot of people that had turned around and said, oh, you know, you're wrong. This is going to 200K. This is going to a million dollars all of a sudden they can kind of run in, in terms of, can you teach me? Can you show me? Can we, you know, can we get involved? And it's always the same. It's kind of too little, too late. And I think going back to the echo chamber, going back to, you know, the likes of Blackrock making everybody rich. It's, this is where the logic kind of comes in. You know, it's the big players make their money, you know, almost taking it from the little players. You know, this is where that kind of stems from. And I think when you're buying Bitcoin at 40K, 50K, 60K, you know, it's not as easy as what it used to be, you know, and, and, I, and I think this is kind of the main driving factor that a lot of newer kind of, you know, traders join in, kind of join in the club. They're actually missing the point that the, the core, you know, the, the, the core point, the kind of the core value of this right now. And I, I, I guess it's kind of, comical to one degree and it's very sad on the other side and i think this is kind of again maybe the biggest driver for myself personally in terms of why i spend the time you know to educate people you know i i, I think going back in terms of to you know for me as an educator from where i started a lot of the things that people tend to fail to see is they seem to assume that more equals more and that comes everything from, you know, having more screens and more monitors. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm just laughing as the screen's bouncing up and down and I've actually got you on a laptop, you know, and you, think, you know, for me, this is freedom. You know, I'd rather have my little 13 HP laptop and, you know, walk around the garden and do what I do than to actually be tied to a desk. I don't want eight monitors anymore. You know, mm -hmm. this isn't the game. I think, you know, it's the same with indicators. It's the same with instruments. You know, there's a lot of money to be made with one instrument with one monitor with no indicators and i think these are the kind of things that you know lead yourself to 
you know, to understand where a lot of the educational content online, where a lot of the influencers, where a lot of the big players, the media, the social media, you know, where they drive kind of the sheep towards. And I think this is a real big factor, especially in something like crypto, which is, you know, at large, relatively unregulated. But, you know, and I, I think it's a dangerous place in the grand scheme of things. You know, it, it, it's, it's very exciting, but it's also very dangerous. And I think as long as people understand that, you know, it, it's how do you get that message across without being, you know, you're a perma bear, you're anti-crypto, you're anti-Bitcoin. And, and I think that's just, you know, that's just the genuine sentiment is that, you know, there's a lot of money to be made, but there's also other markets where a lot of money can be made mm. as well as crypto slash Bitcoin, you know? Awesome. You know, um, I think that's a good little pivot point. Um, so I, I do want to talk about where the market is today and just kind of have the zoomed out picture and continue. I see like the the fifth wave painted there in the all time high. So there's yeah. there's more to this story. But just because you brought it up, I want to mention, you know, when when I first or we reached out to each other, I think I reached out to you. I like found your tele or your um, discord server. And so we started talking in there and we had, you know, a, a phone conversation and then you were kind enough to send me a copy of your book. And you said some things just now that reminded me of um, some of what was in here. And so I just want to mention it quickly because, uh, you know, this is this is a really cool book and it's really accessible. It was it, it took probably four or five different pillars of um, different personalities and, and theories and concepts and, and tied it all into one clear view that by the end of it, I walked away feeling like I, I actually had some literacy or more literacy. It, it took all these little bits and pieces that I had learned independently and put it in a nice picture. But I have to say the beginning of the book, um, it was frustrating to me because of comments like you just made about like, you know, you have a whole chapter in here that just basically talks about how indic indicators are crap. And, you know, coming into crypto, that's one of the first things that you can kind of learn and then feel like you have some competency and like, you know, you can bring up trading view and, and have these things. And now you feel like, okay, I'm actually going a step deeper on my path. And you're like, nope, that's, you know, you're leading yourself astray if you've got 10 indicators on and they're all, you know, and, and, and I agree with a lot of the sentiment in that, you know, if, if what your indicator is showing you is just the confirmation of your bias that you already have anyway, it's not doing you any good. And to actually understand these larger scale and, and logical uh, underpinnings of the market is a much more um, rooted mindset Maybe let's just take a second to talk about, you know, where this book came from, why you wrote it, and, you know, what what is the the main message that a reader will get after they've read it? So I, I think initially the general idea was I was writing it for my son. My son kind of done his first trading exams kind of at 11, put him through the eToro kind of course. And I just wanted to kind of give him almost a legacy. It was something that I thought, you know, if I made a notepad and kind of put, you know, all my 20 odd years worth of experience into notes, then it was something that he could pick up at any time in the future, you know, and just kind of go through them. So it started off as a bit of fun, started off as something I just thought, you know, it was a, a notepad that I'd had in the house and it just kind of started like this. I mentioned to someone that I was writing, you know, this for my son and, and kind of, you know, explaining from an educational perspective to a kid, you know, how to trade, how to see these things logically. And uh, they said, oh, you know, you, you should write this as a book. So I thought, oh, actually, that's, you know, that's something I probably could do. So the original idea was to stick it out as a Kindle, you know, self-publish it and so on. And it, I just kind of fell, I guess, into kind of into the publisher. So I had another friend and they introduced me to a publisher. Within a couple of days, they'd send me contracts and, you know, an offer for the book, it was, you know, we love, you know, we love the story, we love the backstory, we, you know, we love the content. And obviously, I'd never had any kind of plan or intention to get it, you know, published. So it's kind of how or where it come from. But I guess the main thing that I wanted to get across in the book, and the main thing I was trying to teach is a lot of the the, the greats, I guess, as you would say, you know, in, in terms of Elliot and, and Gan and people like Dow. <sighs> I, 
I think what I realized kind of early on is a lot of the books that I'd read kind of in the space and in, and in kind of the trading category, the genre, a, a lot of them either had very singular type strategies. They would use one form of, of method or one technique, or they would leave you with not enough info to kind of take the next step. So you either had the very early stage, you know, baby pips type platform in a book, or you had someone's very singular type of opinion in terms of one direction, one method, one technique, you know, one set of indicators that works for them. And trading, I think for me with, you know, Gann and Elliot and Wyckoff and so on is, it's less about the technique and more about the sentiment. Mm. And the sentiment across the whole market. Now, whether Gan, Wyckoff, you know, Elliot, these guys knew what they tapped into, or whether it was more they had an idea and didn't really know where it fitted. So I think for me, when you understand, you know, the numbers that I've got, you know, here are the three, the four, the five, these are based on the Elliott wave extensions and, and the retracements. The distribution is based on the white cloth, you know, teaching. And overall, the trend direction is what Dow talked about in terms of a primary trend, secondary trend, pullback, and so on. So I guess understanding that, you know, humans and human nature kind of creates the sentiment per se. It was how you can kind of put this together to understand that market is seeking liquidity, but the liquidity is pocketed mm -hmm. where humans have actually placed it. You know, so whether it's psychological for them or, you know, kind of in the subconscious mind that people have placed these stop losses, placed these new orders, you know, placed these kind of, you know, entry positions or exit positions almost perfectly hmm. and you know i mean this image that i got on the screen you know people have said to me well how did you know 28 was the level you know this is why this is how this is you know this is how you put these pieces together and as you said in terms of coming to the last bit and the last bit of the swing to the current all-time high i'll touch on this in a second after we finished in terms of the book but this was exactly the same notion this was exactly the same techniques exactly the same you know, mentality and mindset in terms of why we would end up just past the previous all-time high. Hmm. Uh, you know, and that's interesting. That for me is is the bit that I find <laughs> fascinating with the markets in general, not just with Bitcoin. You know, this is, it's how it works, why it works and why it keeps working. So I think in terms of going from the 28, kind of up, back down and to the current all-time high. The next post, which was this one, I talked about this, and right? this is the, you know, the Wall Street cheat sheet. Mm. Right? This is talking about the optimism, the belief, the thrill, the euphoria, you know, where people actually get then complacent with the markets going up for infinity. Mm. You know, and this is the mindset, this is the mentality, and this is what makes it easy in terms of taking these types of moves. Now, as I said about the $2,500 sweep from this level, we'd already had the reaccumulation. We're now in the distribution phase. We'd had the drop down to the level that we anticipated. We're now starting to move up. The one thing that we saw very quick in this move, and this is not dissimilar to where we are today in the current price, right? If you look at the current move here, you're going to see this zero, one, two, which in Elliott terms is what you'd refer to as nesting, right? This is kind of a move inside the move. This is the fractal move of, of, a, of a bigger degree swing. Now, I'll zoom in on this a little bit more. I think I got this one slightly underneath um, the image. Let me come back to that one. And I'll find the image underneath that one. Uh, I thought I had it there. Nope. Okay. I'll have to zoom in on my screen. So. What I actually said and stated there, right, was the market's going to come to just above the 65K level, right? Without, you know, naming the name and, and saying, you know, the market's going to sweep 65K. This is what we likely to see. 
So we're going to go to 65K or just above. We're going to attract a new round of buyers, a new round of fools, in essence. This is kind of, you know, the Warren Buffett kind of great the fool theory. Mm -hmm. We're going to catch all these people going long. And we're going to drop back down to 40K again very quick, right? So I'm making this call, you know, here. This is obviously this one, the long bull scenario. This was the 24th of August, just as you can see, the 24th of August there. And, you know, the general idea was we were going to drop down four, rally at five. We were going to take the liquidity at 65K. And then we're going to see 40K again very quick. So that was the general idea. That was the, you know, the market move. That was kind of what I was anticipating. That's what I was looking for. And if we jump back into the current kind of chart position, you know, what we'll see on this is that we actually hit the 40K level, which from the top down was this candle here, hmm. right? Then we had obviously the knee jerk reaction. And then we continue the move down, right? So this obviously was what I was starting to see. This is what you could see kind of play out. And I think going back to what I was saying about, you know, seeing this being institutionalized, the real kind of value, the real nuggets, the real, you know, the real interesting part for me was the fact that we could see these things the wrong way. We were seeing these things play out kind of in real time. I was posting and talking about it, but you know, every single time that I would post one of these posts, you know, it was negative. You know, it was kind of like, oh, you're anti-Bitcoin, you're anti-crypto, you're anti-this, you know, you're kind of perma bear you. And, you know, it was just kind of happening over and over again. So, you know, I think for me, I'm, I'm you know, I'm not bothered enough to care in terms of other people's opinions. And, and that's kind of the nice place to be in terms of getting in kind of right at the bottom and, and kind of sitting on this and sitting pretty with this. But I think... As an educator, what becomes more frustrating is when people don't want to see the obvious. You know, they're looking at this, you know, they're looking at this chart inside of that echo chamber. And at this particular point, this was actually a, a bit of a dig towards plan B. So I'd reached out to the guy and said, hey, you know, your prediction for 135K is, is a little bit off. Let me explain why. The guy instantly blocked me. All right. Yeah. So. Obviously, at this point, I'm saying, well, no, no, we're actually dropping down, you know, um, we dropped down, we dropped down to the 40k. We get to this particular stage. And again, kind of understanding from an Elliot perspective, what we were likely to see. Well, clearly, if we'd had this small distribution from the top, we were actually likely to see a redistribution halfway down. So early on in the move, I actually put a couple of clues out to say, do you understand what a trend line break looks like? You know, do you understand this particular move? Do you see what's about to happen next? You know, and I'm putting this out obviously to, you know, to the students within Discord. I'm putting this out, you know, internally. And I'm putting this out to the public is a bit cryptic in terms of the message. It was look, you know, I'm I'm trying to help you guys here, but clearly you don't want help. Mm. You know, I'm trying to give you where we go next. We obviously go up. We go down, we go up, we go down. So we go up, we go down, we go up, we go down. We follow on to the high and we break through. We get this move, which is this move, and we carry on the drop down. Hmm. You know, this isn't lucky guessing. You know, this is obviously 24th, 2022 now. And I'm given the logic as to why this price is dropping down. You know, it, it's what else can you say? What else can you, you know, what else can you give? If people are saying, no, you know, you're wrong, you know, you're, you're wrong. Bitcoin's going to a million dollars, you know, plan B said we're off to 135K. You know, you don't go from 135K to 15K <laughs> to have any clout in the industry. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I've grappled with that a bit too, because, um, yeah, my, my channel is always way more popular when price is dropping and people want to know why and they want to kind of be coddled a little bit and have some logic. And then as soon as things turn around even a little bit, they don't want to have anything to do with clarity or logic because it goes against their bet. And I, I mean, I understand that because I remember when I was, you know, heavily investing, like I only wanted to hear people tell me that I had made smart moves, that I was going to, you know, come out on top. 
And I, I mean, the way that I look at it now is it's a major, or I'm sorry, a minority of a minority that are looking for this content and actually willing to take the time to learn it. And ultimately, if there's one of those people out of a hundred, it's still worth it. And it's still, it's still fun to have the conversation and be in the know, even if the, yeah. um, the wider audience isn't interested, like, what can you do? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it think. Yeah. And I think this is exactly the kind of the point. And, you know, I, I, I think, again, from a personal point of view, you know, this is just fascinating, you know, and this is kind of the fact that it's happening for the first time in a major cycle. I think the whole ETF situation, you know, it's, it's, it's changing the dynamic. It's changed the landscape, you know, and I think this is where, for me, I'm more intrigued as to how this plays next. So I think, obviously, as we start to, to drop down to, you know, to kind of the bottom levels, we drop down to, you know, why I'm calling this, you know, smart money, dumb trades, hmm. is that we really needed a larger accumulation, right? This, this, for me, is just logically, if you're going to go for a long distance drive, you need to put gas in the tank. You need to put that fuel in your vehicle for a long drive. If we have a small accumulation down here, how far do you really think we can go? How far do you think this is really going to be driven by institutional players? Right. I posted a post the other day on Trading Week, and someone came along and said, Oh, what about the multiplier effect? You know, for every dollar, you know, there's four dollars, five dollars. I read somewhere that someone had stated there was $118 for every dollar that goes into Bitcoin. Right. For me, the, the, the math doesn't add up. Right, the logic just isn't there. There's going to be a multiplier effect that happens during the bull run, but it's not sustainable. It's not going to be, you know, a fixed number. This is something that will fluctuate depending on the day, the volume, you know, the number of of, of traders within that space at that time. So even if we give it the benefit of the doubt, we say, hey, we, you know, we forex the kind of multiplier effect right now. You know, if we are seeing 12 ETFs being approved and, and launched and money coming in. Why isn't Bitcoin already at the all-time high or beyond? These are the kinds of questions that are just simple logic. The math is not really adding up for me right now in terms of you know where we're at, right? So when I started talking about this at the bottom, the general idea, right, was we're gonna move up and ideally we come back down, right? So we hit 32k. 35k this was kind of the level for me mm. that was almost optimal for a textbook type accumulation this would have been the ideal scenario right in terms of moving up because it would have given us sustainable growth longer term so the general idea was at this particular point the monthly stochastics pointing down we've had this rally up now if you zoom in on this particular image what you can see is the price moves up and the volume goes down a lot of people would say to me, oh, well, when the price moves up, the volume goes down because the price is greater. Well, how do we argue the price rallying here, which is the same kind of price? How do we argue the price rallying here with volume increasing? And this price is actually greater than the current price. So even the arguments that you get in, in terms of, oh, it's up only, there's nothing to support that or back that up, you know, bigger picture. And for me, it's just the fact of, you know, adding a little bit of logic to these charts to say, we've gone up, volume's gone down. You know, what is this in terms of a definition? You know, this is divergence. Mm -hmm. You know, you go and stick into chat GPT. You know, give me the definition of divergence. Tell me what divergence is like I'm 10. <laughs> you know, you're going to get a simple answer. You know, something is not quite right in terms of the move up. So when we're at this particular point, right, this is now for me where a couple of things start to, you know, kind of come together, piece together, right? So in terms of the current price, the current levels, if I look at the most recent post, this one here, this particular post, right, I talked about a couple of things to, to just I guess, kind of make people think, right? This was kind of the, 
the general idea of this particular post. I hadn't posted for a while on Trading View, it was just a post. I hadn't streamed for a while. And all I was trying to do is to highlight, you know, how a market cap works. Now, again, some people come in and they say, oh, well, it's different for Bitcoin. Is this, this, this? And you say, oh, well, okay, look, I don't care what it is. Without going into how technical you want to get, you have to look at it in some way, shape, or form as if it's a company. Right, you break down a market cap of a company, pretty obvious. It's number of shares in circulation right, times the price. We had the price at the day. We had the number of coins in circulation. So if you tell me now we're going to add a multiplier to this, how are you going to get your market cap based on the multiplier numbers? Is there a gap between the current value? And what we call the sploosh pool, right? The money that's kind of back in. Money out, money in, money out, money in, right? If someone like BlackRock comes along or Vanguard or someone like, you know, Grayscale comes along and they drop a whole bunch of coins as the multiplier moves up, the issue we have is the price will drop down a lot further faster without the cash to support that move, right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually a negative in the grand scheme of things with the, a multiplier, right? Or it can be perceived as a negative, right? So all I've done with this particular post, we just talked about, we currently have market cap. This was when the price was 43,000, right? So a market cap of around 820 billion. The numbers obviously, you know, this times this, easy. If we were to see a 69K high, which we saw, back in 2021, with a market cap of 1.3 trillion, right? The numbers are there, you can go into, you can go into to TradingView, for example, right, if I move this again, you come into TradingView, you can put in um, Bitcoin market cap, right? And market cap there is gonna give us hmm. the current market cap, right? So we've got this market cap. Now, does that look too off? Where's the multiplier? You know, why isn't this market cap at one trillion already? We've just gone up three grand. You know, these are the kinds of questions, right? So what I tried to do was to kind of highlight how silly some of these arguments are. So what I did was I posted this with, this is the price kind of squished in because I wanted to get a half a million dollars worth of valuation on the screen. And then I've just put these lines in to represent the end of each year. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, right? And the idea was hmm. for us to get to this valuation, forget the multiplier, I'm talking just in company terms, right? Just kind of simple terms without any of the complications of how you can justify Bitcoin to multiply. To get around 500K, we're going to need 9 trillion. 9.8 trillion, right? Let's assume that we do take a multiplier and we, we divide that by four. We still need three times as much money coming in as the previous all-time high, including the multiplier. So my big question is, where's money coming from? Hmm. You know, who, who's providing that level of finance? Well, the answer that I get to this question nine times out of 10 is BlackRock, BlackRock, right? So I've even gone in as far as to say, let me give you something else that helps you understand that in terms of BlackRock's levels. BlackRock managed just under 10 trillion, 10 trillion US dollars, right? Their largest ETF, their largest pot in terms of an ETF is 354 billion. Right. This was founded in 2001. And this is their largest ETF. So let's assume that every single ETF that has just been approved, they all have exactly the same pot size. And they all put in $350 billion in one year, one week, one month. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll give them the benefit of the doubt and take it to the multiplier. 
Now we get our nine trillion dollars worth of extra money coming into Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is still only at 500k. And I've given the most unrealistic scenario possible. You know, this isn't me saying, oh, I'm a perma bear. You know, this is me saying, hey, you, you know, here's the logic and this is how you can back this up. So, so here's a question I've been meaning to ask you because this still boggles my mind is on a daily basis, I can go on to any of these news feeds and I can find, you know, the plan Bs, that's kind of obvious. I think these guys are kind of charlatans. They're making a lot of money just from the exposure. Okay, we'll just kind of take them off the table. There's still these analysts that apparently work at different investment firms that are making claims, you know, the, and even like the Kathy Woods and you know, what is it about this space that would make seemingly, you know, rational people go out publicly and say, I think we're going to a million. I mean, there was one, and again, it's, I think it's a lot of it just publicity, but someone was like, we're going to a million within weeks. I don't know when it's going to start, but like, we're going to be at a million in a week. Like what, are these people really that misinformed? Do they believe what they're saying? What's your take? There's, there's two things, right? So when it comes to obviously the media, the first thing you have to realize is the, the media is almost kind of a contrarian indicator in itself, mm. right? Now, if you want to kind of dive deep down the rabbit hole, there's conspiracy theories, there's, you know, who owns the media, you know, there's all these questions that you kind of ask yourself, right? It, it's what do they want you to see? What, what, what are you allowed to see, right? So that's the first thing for me. I don't think a lot of these guys are misinformed i think it's actually the narrative of the company that they're working for or working with hmm. in terms of giving the information right there's actually websites especially in the forex market right there's websites if you go to something like igindex.com and you go into their sentiment tool their sentiment tool has actually got a weighted indicator as to what retail are actually doing so if retail are long euro you know why, why would i want to be long euro you know long euro all of a sudden euros drop in you know 200 pips but it's the sentiment that's there it's the kind of collective sentiment so i think for me the question really comes down to if you're going to look at the news you're going to you're going to go looking for information on the news is where do they benefit from right now the difference for, for kind of crypto to maybe forex or, or commodities in general is that you're looking at news outlets that sell news you've got paid for subscriptions you've got you know paid for advertising within that space do you think they're going to sell many copies of you know the financial times if they turn around and say bitcoin's going to zero mm -hmm. i don't want that on the front page of the times i want bitcoins going to a million i will buy the times to find out why mm -hmm. you know and and this is kind of this is the dilemma but this is you know this is an age-old you know argument this is Anybody knows this, you know, kind of in the space. And there's one quote that I love, and I, I can't remember the exact words, but it was something along the lines of, you know, again, Warren Buffett's quote. And it was something like, you know, Wall Street, it's the only place on earth where people who drive Rolls Royces go to take advice from people who take the subway. <laughs> and I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Because I think the problem being is you've got these, you got these people entering the space, right? And I think you've almost got different bands, especially in the crypto world and the crypto domain. You've got these different bands, right? You've got people that are looking for the lottery punt. You know, I'll put in my last $500. I'm going to, I'm going to make this rich. You've got the next level of people that maybe have taken some life savings. They've taken, you know, five, $10,000 and they are hoping for some kind of return, but they can't really afford to lose that kind of money. Right. You then have the next kind of, band the next category which is almost the most dangerous band right you've got guys that have maybe had a good salary earning a good salary got kind of play money to spend and it's these guys that are ones that are the ones reading the financial times you know the the, the different publications these guys are almost desperate for information the only issue being again from an educator's point of view i've had lawyers doctors you know all kinds of you know serious professions coming to me for education, guys that are, I'd say, captains of industry, you know, they've been CEOs or, you know, in a very high kind of flying role in terms of their, you know, their day job. They're almost suckered in by their own success. 
Hmm. They kind of feel, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm an accountant, you know, I'm a CEO. I make money, that's my goal, that's my job, that's, you know, that's my, what I'm good at. They then have the spare money. They invest that spare money in something they've read in a news article on the way to the office. Mm-hmm. This is the perfect net. This is the perfect tool to capture the right kind of audience. You know, it's, I've got a subscription to Forbes. I have CNBC, you know, on constant loop. Mm-hmm. It's, I have this. And this is the mindset that they know they can easily identify and capture, right? What happens then is this kind of knock-on effect where the guys that are kind of middle class, kind of to the lower end, that I can't afford 15,000, but I can put in five. They're going to follow their friends, their buddies, the guys in the pub, the guys in the bar, the guys, you know, in, in the tennis club. The smart guys they're with the follow shiny these guys on, you know, I want to be the same. I want to get involved. You know, what are you guys investing in? Oh, Bitcoin. And it becomes, you know, it becomes, like I say, it's, it's an echo chamber. It becomes this kind of constant loop. You know, for me, Warren Buffett saying, one of the videos I watched a couple of days back saying, you know, when he looks at buying an asset, an asset is something that can produce an income mm-hmm. and you still have the underlying asset. When you buy a Bitcoin, you are hoping and praying that someone else will come along and buy it off you for a greater price. It's not actually producing any value under the surface. I was actually thinking about this on my drive in to to come and talk to you. I was thinking about what what an ingenious thing to sell people. Like here's something that's going to make you rich, make you powerful, make you smart and it doesn't even cost anything to produce. We don't have to ship it to you. Like there's no there's no overhead involved. In fact, we're going to charge you a fee. We're actually going to charge you to buy it. And that's that's the product and yeah, what you just described, I mean, the the thing that made the most sense to me when I was looking at this whole picture is this is all marketing. This is all a narrative. This is all a story for these invested parties, these vested interests. And when I hear, you know, Michael Saylor saying and doing what he's doing, like Michael Saylor has to do that because if he stops, his, you know, he's invested to the balls, you know, like he he has to make that future happen, otherwise he's going to be completely screwed. So you want to talk about someone with a biased view, you know, a lot of these people, they, they've got, um, you know, it seems that they're, they're deeply personally invested in these outcomes. And that's why they're saying, oh, even without me, this is, this is the next gold. This is the next, you know, thing that you have to be a part of. It's a hedge against the dollar. Dollars are going to zero and Bitcoin is going to be the global currency. And Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's this comes back to the point of it being kind of scary because I, I, I think, you know, without calling Bitcoin, you know, a pyramid scam, there's a lot of kind of footprint there that would suggest that it could be. So I think when you see someone like Warren Buffett, you know, I know Munger's obviously just died, but when you see these guys talking about, you know, why they assume Bitcoin is a scam, hmm. you, you can kind of see where they kind of, you know, grabbing their logic from. I don't believe that it is. I think obviously there is some kind of foundation behind it. I don't think it's just an all out and out scam, but I think it's kind of been painted as a scam to the outside world. I think the problem being is as a techie, you kind of think, well, you know, I can see the the advantage. I can see the benefit. I think for someone that is frightened of missing out, I can see the benefit, you know, but I think when you actually realize what it is, how it does, you know, how it operates. You've got to ask yourself the question, you know, where's the upside? Where's the, where's the advantage? You know, for example, back in 2018, there was a company that I used, a company called Wirex. And I had one of these prepaid Bitcoin debit cards to test mm-hmm. how this would actually work and how the transaction would go on. I simply moved a hundred dollars or a hundred euros, I think in, in terms of the actual price into I bought it through one channel, moved the Bitcoin into the Wirex account, actually gone to the ATM to withdraw the cash. And I was left with $46 from my $100 that I started with. 
And then you kind of ask yourself a question, you know, if I'm, you know, a single mother, third world country, you know, a little village somewhere, how is this going to benefit me? You take, you know, El Salvador as a country. Oh, well, we're going to buy Bitcoin at 60K. It's only going to go up. Now we're at 45. You know, how does this benefit? And I understand that maybe that's too narrow of a view or too narrow of a mindset in terms. And I'm not saying this is my, you know, my take on this right now is these are the things that need iron and out for that true growth to actually occur. You know, we need the fees down to practically nothing. You know, we need transaction rates to be, you know, kind of literally in seconds. You know, I can send $100 from Revolut from one account to another in different countries. And before I've lifted my finger off the screen, I'm getting a text message from the receiving bank saying, hey, you've just received $100. And it's $100, not 46. You know, and therefore the big question is, what's the advantage? You've either got the store of value, which then we go into, this is similar to gold, or we've got a payment transaction system, which means it's a bank or it's a Visa, it's a MasterCard. You know, they can't really be both. Mm. And this is the thing I think Bitcoin kind of has this kind of identity crisis that it needs to be resolved or at least pointed in a direction, which takes me back to what I said at the start, having the foundations, having the platform, having the infrastructure to kind of put it in the direction. Maybe the ETFs kind of are the answer to that. You know, maybe that's the start of, but I think that's the bit that we're lacking right now for the sustainable growth, you know, kind of going forward, you know? Yeah, and and just to kind of step up on the soapbox for just a second, I'm realizing that you know you you've been saying that you're accused of being a perma bear, and I know that like my just general tone about Bitcoin has changed so much from the beginning when I when I truly believed in it, and now you know if someone's listening and they're pro Bitcoin and just I can tell like just the things that we're saying, the way that we're talking, like I just want to make it clear that. I'm I'm not necessarily pro or anti Bitcoin. I am I am so pro a lot of what Bitcoin seemed to stand for. Like I am so pro personal rights and liberties. I'm so pro financial freedom. I'm so pro these things that that's why I was so excited about Bitcoin. And now that I see what it is, I mean it it is what it is, but it's okay, not so on, on, it's on that not, particular point, right? To, yeah. to kind of to cut you off there is you've just mentioned something in terms of being pro Bitcoin, kind of pro what it is, you know, whether it's anti the establishment, kind of freedom, et cetera, et cetera. If you go to buy any form of Bitcoin today, it's the first thing you're gonna need to do. <laughs> yeah. You need to set up an account. A, yeah. No, that's yeah. but that's that's what I'm saying is you know, I'm I'm not the negativity in my Bitcoin is only a reflection of my positivity for the ideals that it was meant to stand for. And so if I have a negative view, it's just because I'm disappointed that some of these ideas and, you know, blockchain and what it can do and, you know, the whole Satoshi, you know, starting Genesis idea, that's, that's really interesting to me. And I'm just disappointed that instead we're in this world of influencers and pump and dumps and, bad information and it's it's taking all of that energy that wants something different in a global community and instead you know muting it manipulating it into these other areas that are you know more of the same only faster and uh 24 7 so yeah i mean i just i i want to vocalize that because i'm yeah i don't want to just come out like i hate bitcoin and it's garbage blah blah <laughs> it's just like i want these ideals in the world i just want to be real yeah. about is this it and maybe maybe it's not maybe it's a lot of hype and marketing around buzzwords Do you know what i think personally I, I i kind of feel that it's kind of set the wheel in motion and therefore i don't think it's the kind of the final version or the final iteration of I think it's kind of opened the door, right? Mm, yeah. And I kind of feel the issue for me w w with it overall is when I first started, right? You could you could buy Bitcoin. Nobody needed your passport or your driver's license, utility bill, what color toothbrush you were using in the morning. You know, you didn't need any of this. All of a sudden, you get these kind of brokers and, and exchanges and kind of middlemen. 
then you get the people that jump around on the stage, you know, wearing stupid outfits, kind of renting private jets for the afternoon. Hmm. You know, the reality is that's not the kind of financial advice, you know, the, the big boys are going to be looking for. It's not, you know, I think the representatives of Bitcoin in its current state are the wrong set of clowns. Hmm. I think what it needs is the regulation. It needs the clarity. It needs the security. You know, if I if I make a payment, say using you know a, a, an American Express, if something happens there and I'm out of pocket, I'm going to get refunded tomorrow. If I make a Bitcoin transaction, oh well, you were lost. There's the kind of issue that mm. you're facing. Why would anyone? transition to that in its current state. So I think for me, the fact that if you go through the, I, I, I suppose there's a prospectus document that Black, uh, BlackRock put together for their fund and for the ETF. And it's a really fascinating read because they actually mention the word regulation about 160 times mm. throughout the document, right? That for me is fascinating, again, kind of in its own right, because I think the regulation is where they see it and how they see it. And they've obviously got the ability, the money, the, the backing, the support to make that happen. I think at that stage, it becomes interesting again. Hmm. However, the issue that you face or the dilemma that you face at that particular stage is kind of almost everything that Bitcoin was not supposed to represent. Mm -hmm. It was, well, you don't need a bank, but now you need an exchange. Well, when the exchange makes money, do they keep their money in Bitcoin or do they cash out? They cash out, who do they use? Well, they use the banks. So there's always going to be that cash in, cash out, KYC, AML. You know, Big Brother knows what it is you are doing. Mm. But blockchain's an immutable ledger, which means it's hard to keep money under the mattress without someone knowing money's under the mattress. Mm. So again, it comes back kind of full circle in terms of the idea is sound. I think the execution has been off. And I think that comes from, you know, I remember the founder of Ethereum saying, you know, oh, I've set up Ethereum because I'm going to reduce fees. You know, Bitcoin shouldn't have the fees that it's got. You try buying an NFT. <laughs> you know, these are the problems. It's the greed of the middleman. It's the greed of the influencer. It's the, you know, affiliate chilling and, and the links. And we'll give you X number of Bitcoin for doing this and so on. And I think that when you go and you see these kind of Bitcoin conferences, it's the wrong crowd on stage. Mm. It's the wrong representation of a genuine technology. You can't take people like Moon Carl serious. You know, these are the kinds of clowns that I feel that are kind of almost dampening the space and restricting the growth. So coming back to obviously the ETFs and what I've still got on the screen there, right, is you know, if you look at the, the, the numbers and you look at the multiply, you look at all these things. For me, the things that are holding it back right now are none of the above. It's not, you know, the miners and the miners selling off. It's it's not, you know, BlackRock buying and nobody else is or Grayscale selling and, you know, kind of dampening the whole ETF kind of scene. Mm -hmm. Is you look at these numbers, right? This goes back to, you know, let's just use the, the, the bigger numbers. It's 2021, right? We had in 2021 globally, 8,552 ETFs, right? Managing $10 trillion at its peak, hmm. right? Now, we just talked about $9 trillion being the magic number to get Bitcoin to half a million dollars. With or without the multipliers, you know, kind of at your own discretion, right? We're talking about $10 trillion across 8,552 ETFs. Now break that 10 trillion into 12 ETFs for Bitcoin. What are the numbers realistically supposed to be per ETF? The, the logic is there. You know, you can't you can't come back and say, oh well, the multiplier could be a thousand dollars per Bitcoin. You know, for every dollar in, thousand dollar worth of increase. We're certainly not seeing that at the moment. Hmm. You know, and these are the kinds of problems that I'm seeing right now in terms of the bigger picture. This is something else I've showed quite a lot. 
Mm. This is the COT, right? This is commitment of traders. This is the leverage funds. This is the kind of the only thing that really matters when it comes to Bitcoin. The money managers, they're actually net long, right? So there's definitely growth for the future. But as a money manager, you've got a 15 to 20 year horizon in terms of your money returns coming to fruition. When you start talking to somebody who's invested $5,000 of all of their savings, that you're going to see some growth in 15 years. Mm -hmm. It's not the kind of movement that they want. They want to be rich tomorrow. You know, so I think for me, a lot of these things are just, you know, again, highlighting the obvious kind of bringing this through. And, and to go back to that chart one more time, the, the yeah. red plot there is those are shorts. These are short positions of the larger operators. So my question then back to anybody, you know, kind of watching this, anybody kind of thinking about this is some people will say, oh, look, the big boys are getting wrecked. They're actually going short. This doesn't mean that they're selling in terms of expecting a short. It's these guys selling at a profit to the greater fool that wants to buy at a premium. Mm -hmm. You know, this is buying expensive Bitcoin right now. The logic again is, is, you know, it's there. And I think this is the beauty of it. Okay, so I, I guess the last thing for me to kind of just to cover, right, in terms of the logic and, you know, that was kind of, I guess, the whole point of what we've discussed all the way through this mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, a lot of people are jumping on, oh, Bitcoin's bullish and Bitcoin to the moon and, you know, Bitcoin to a million dollars and so on. There's two major, major factors, right? that I'm, you know, a little bit concerned about in the grand scheme of things, right? So first things first, I'm going to show you this on a larger time frame on a monthly, right? And, you know, whether you understand it or not, right? <laughs> there's, there's one, one obvious factor, right? You've actually got the difference between red and green momentum more or less transitioning from that high, all right? We're still in this position. The only problem that I have personally, right, is this here starts to rally. And just like the volume, the momentum starts to drop. Definition of divergence again, right? So when you then zoom in, a time when we take this down to a weekly view, what becomes kind of almost more interesting, right, is if you zoom right out and you see the same kind of picture with a slightly different view, right, clear as day, green, a little bit of red, right, as the red is formed, the momentum starts dropping, ready for the rally. As the red is formed again, Momentum starts dropping, ready for the rally, mm. right? We then get this little peak, which is green, right? And then we kind of rally again, right? So we get momentum down for the builder, right? At the moment, look at the green that's on the screen there. All the way up to the first major all-time high, 65k. So what are we seeing after 65K? Well, we've had a truncated move up with the liquidity sweep. And we've had an aggressive move down to the low. Which takes me back to the potential of this being the A followed by B, right? Now, if you look again from a, a Dow theory perspective, a move that is in a rally or an impulsive move, a motive move, should be supported by sufficient volume, giving you the evidence that the move is up and going to keep going up, right? It's mm -hmm. sustainable. The issue that we have is price has gone up and momentum has gone down. So let's go back and look at the volume profile here and the lack of the volume profile here. 
And with your indicator there, the, it is an oscillator. So it goes from momentum going up, momentum going down. So yeah. momentum has been going down. It's about to go up again, but it's going to be going up in the red. So the momentum is going to increase like we saw in you know July or whatever that is down yeah. there of 2021. Yeah. So and what it, we're expecting now is obviously the momentum to rally as obviously we start the shift. To, to mimic, you know, from this point here down, right? So this is only one, you know, one aspect. I think with everything we've covered, right, it's kind of obvious in terms of, you know, retail are not going to get rich overnight. That's the first kind of core point, right? ETFs are not going to happen within a month and fill up their kind of pots and $9 trillion enter in the market, even with a multiplier, right? That's the second kind of major point. If you look at the size of BlackRock's biggest ETF, you know, there's your third piece of information. If we look at the lack of volume as the price has moved up, there's our biggest clue in terms of divergence, right? We've got momentum falling as prices rise, and there's your second clue in terms of divergence, right? So what I'm seeing right now is larger scale move down, right? Colossal scale up, larger scale down, smaller scale currently up. But we've come up. And almost run out of steam. Right? So what I'm seeing right now is this current move is what I would call a wick fill. You're filling the previous wick to catch people into going long. If you do all the extensions on the Fibonacci's from this, what we're seeing right now, right? And, and I've actually shared this to some of the members yesterday. We're actually looking at this, right? And what's actually scary in all of this, if we assume that the B is in, right? And we stick Fibonacci extension, zero to A, up to B, right? Hmm. One of the major, major levels and lines, right, is your 618 in terms of a retracement type move. We've actually got liquidity sitting underneath, liquidity sitting underneath, right? And obviously there's a massive box here, which is something that we teach in terms of this master pattern type move, right? So for me, there's liquidity all the way here. Doesn't have to come to 15, could even be halfway of this box, right? So we've got somewhere along the regions of say 19 to 20, 5k realistic right? and just to be if clear when you, say, what, when you say these pockets of liquidity you're talking about these are areas where we know there's a lot of buying interest or selling interest yeah. so this yeah. is where the action took place before this is where we know people have orders already placed and so for us to retrace back we're going to be as you said filling the tank again because now people are yeah. buying in with fresh dollars they're getting ready for a move they're you know the narrative basically restarts yeah so what i would have loved right and this goes back to what i said earlier about you know the ideal situation last year right would have been we stayed in this kind of range this particular move was based on the black rock fake news that obviously turned out to be true in the end the problem was that this move actually priced in mm. the current situation of all the etfs being approved right what actually happened from a, an accumulation point of view is we, we kind of almost scrapped it hmm. we literally come up right and instead of playing in this field and dropping back down giving us further accumulation coming back up coming back down playing we've actually gone up broken the accumulation right at this particular point which then takes me back to the scenario that I said last year is the one scenario I hope doesn't play itself out. This one. Which is right? exactly what happened. When you press play on that and you move forward, the obvious B. <laughs> Where do we see liquidity? Where do we see the move? Where do we see the price? There's one pocket, two pocket, major pocket. 
if you run the Fibonacci extensions into these moves, these are the pockets that you'll find based on a pullback move, right? So let's assume that, you know, this is completely wrong and, and this has been, you know, oh, well, you're looking for something, you're trying to find a pattern, which most humans do, right? Let's assume that this is our zero. This is our one. Well, what do you do? You come back for a two. Two in Elliott terms is often deep. And if you put something like a fib retracement in, where do we see the deep move in the same pocket, right? So let's just assume that we are wrong and this isn't bearish, this is completely bullish. The major issue that we then have is that we'd have to measure our extension based on this type of move, taking us back into a pocket, which will put us back to this kind of region, right? Three, before we have to come back down for a four, which means the cycle is much, much longer into next year, the year after, the following year. But we could be seeing the high cap of 72,000, roughly, right? Which means we're going to see potentially a triple top. And that's the best case scenario right now. <laughs> so again, <laughs> the issue for me is I don't want this scenario to play out. If we go up from you, this is the most likely scenario left on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what you want to see is you want to see the completion of that ABC come back down in that channel, just pay the piper, but have a lot more green field ahead rather than exactly. just doing this whole dance exactly. and doing a lot of work just to get back to previous all-time high. Well, this is the thing, you know, people come to me and they say, oh, you know, you, you were bearish and, and we are bullish and this, that, and the other. I'm saying, you know, we've just had 12 ETFs approved, right? We've got nothing kind of blocking us on the way to the green field, as you say. And yet we are still today $24,000 under the current all-time high. You know, how, how can you... You know, how can you even argue this being this is bullish right now? We've yet to close above. So from a, a, a primitive trend line perspective, we're not bullish. From a momentum volume perspective, we're not bullish. We've just seen 12 ETFs come to the marketplace and we've still not touching the all-time high. What's left for us to get, to achieve, to break an all-time high? And that's my only question to, you know, to anybody is if the ETFs were not the fuel to break the all-time high, what is? Yeah. <laughs> and it gets back to kind of how we started this, that your interest in this market and markets in general is to make money. Bitcoin, yeah. we're, we're in a really interesting place. Where we're actually seeing something evolve in real time from yeah. just something brand new, never thought of before to being adopted and brought into this, you know, longstanding marketplace of, um, you know, traditional finance, et cetera. So yeah, back to what we were saying in the beginning. I mean, for me, what this was a big sounding horn is like, man, get off the screens. Like, you know, if I want to learn to trade, I can learn to trade, but to to pull back and actually figure out what in my life I I want to be invested in, which, you know, this this picture of the story that we're talking about, you know, if you're on Twitter every day and you're just looking for every little bit of hopium to keep that buzz going, um, you know, it might have a, a pretty dismal outcome. But if people are in this space, they do want to make money, they do want to, you know, play the game, but do so more um yeah, with a sober perspective, you know, there, there's time here. That's what I've been saying to my audience. Like, you know, crypto is not going anywhere without you. It's a it's a great place to learn and to look and to kind of yeah. cut your teeth. Um, what do you tell people in your in your Discord server? People coming to you for education, like, what next? You know, maybe Bitcoin isn't going to a million in a in a week, 
like yeah. what what can what can someone do to play well, the I, game? I think uh, the markets, you know, I I think obviously for me personally, you know, forex is kind of my bread and butter. Forex is the main kind of gig for me. I think for Bitcoin, for XRP, or something else that I hold. But for me, it's it's a long run play. If that takes fifteen years, you know, I'm not going to lose any sleep. You know, that's kind of the point. I want to be playing with the big boys. You know, this is the kind of game that makes you know, a lot of money over a long period. If I'm looking at this from a trading perspective, right, and again, this is kind of how ridiculous this is. This is the kind of information, this is the kind of thing I'll tell my followers is, you know, if I'm looking at potentially, you know, a 72,000, I've got to give myself a little bit of room in case, which means I'm going to come just below the previous all-time high. If I assume that my stop loss has to be where I'm seeing the liquidity grab, then that trade there is not even a one-for-one -one risk reward. This isn't the kind of trade that makes anybody money. You know, you can see these moves. You can see, you know, oh, what if I got in and, and I had a tight stop loss and I bought this, you know, there? Yeah, great. But what are the odds of this playing out? You know, what is the likelihood of this playing out? And as a professional trader, what you're trying to do is to put the odds in your favor, nothing else. And that's how I'm seeing it right now. So for me, you know, oh, well, would you go buy in Bitcoin? Why? My buy was down here. Oh, well, what if I bought Bitcoin? Well, if you're buying Bitcoin, what's your stop loss? What's your take profit? You know, and for me, the biggest thing, going back to social media, the influences, it just seems to be in the crypto space. Nobody seems to be wrong. Everybody bought 15,000. Everybody sold at 69,000. Although you go back through the records and, you know, we had people like, you know, some of these influencers saying things like, we're never going to see 47K again. But we're currently under 47K now. You know, and you think these are the same people that are claiming the claims of, Oh, well, we have, you know, we massively in profit. You know, they were buying 69,000, expecting 135K next month. And these are the kinds of things that, you know, from a trading point, I think you've got to have your exit. You've got to have your take profit. You've got to have your stop loss. And that's the difference between, you know, a trader and a gambler. Hmm. You know, so that's, that's how I'm seeing it right now. I think for me, there's definitely something to take away in terms of learning. There's definitely education to be had in here. And the way that Bitcoin is behaving right now, although it's a bit, you know, kind of wishy-washy from the Black Rock kind of hype move, we've actually got a pretty textbook move. If this plays out and we come back down for a C, we've seen a textbook example of a long here. We've seen a textbook reaccumulation there, textbook distribution here, textbook reaccumulation with a truncated five, liquidity sweep, trend line break distribution or redistribution, you know, everything's there. And on that particular note, right, to kind of finish with for me, if you look at the market cycle and we assume, you know, say we've got a one, we've got a two, we've got a three, we've got a four, we've got a five. Let's just say that this paints a one. Let's assume that this paints our two and we've already had the move. We're going to come back down for a nested two if this is our one anyway. Right. The only issue being is when you then move these levels out, you go three, four, five. We're looking at the potential dangers of maybe only capping out at 100K. And this move being the hyper extended move. Right. Because that would be technically a larger scale three. The larger scale four will be so drawn out that that'll take us to 20, 30 and beyond. And we might not have even visited 100K yet which is why I feel coming back for fuel in the tank is optimal for bigger picture. And that's how I feel. Yeah, I love it. And time will tell, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, the, the main challenge, if you're buying Bitcoin now or you're buying kind of around these kind of levels, you know, it, it's, it's a 50-50 punt. Hmm. in that sense and you know nobody's going to know exactly what this does i've been very lucky to date in, in terms of calling these moves and understanding these moves but like i said i was also in the right place at the right time buying the bottom so 
in that sense, you know, it's kind of luck more than judgment. And the transition for me has been, you know, what I've commentated on, you know, what I've actually been running this commentary on, you know, over the last two to three years. Yeah. And I think that's probably a, a really good way to kind of wrap up here because I, I think this is one of the best conversations I've ever had, like bar none and the way that you did walk through what you were saying, when you were saying it, why you were saying it, and just how it logically explained what we're looking at here. Um, putting yeah. everything in a context that is grounded in logic, not just the the hopium is what I really hope, you know, viewers, listeners are getting from this conversation. Um, yeah, I don't know that much more really needs to be said. I think that's part of the reason why you keep saying like nothing's changed, nothing's changed. I mean, we're now looking at you know, from the volatility of something like a 2021 market where it's like, you know, ups and downs, you know, kind of on a monthly basis, we're now talking about and looking at moves of interest that are over, you know, months, years. Yeah. It's a, it's a longer play. That's exactly what things like a BlackRock ETF and the other 11 coming in are going to do to the market. You know, it's, it's, you can see the volatility drop on the weekends, for example, you go back two, three, four weekends, you know, you see the volatility drop the weekends. The reality is it's great for the industry long term, but it's a different game that the industry is now playing short term. And that's how, like I said, that's how you've got to see the market. It's, you know, th this is a, a different time horizon with the bigger boys playing by mm -hmm. different rules. And the irony is, is that this is what a lot of people were hoping would happen. You know, institutional adoption, you know, more money in the space. And it's like, be careful what you wish for. Like, do you want Let, the wild Let's get the banks or... involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, Lewis, I really, really appreciate your time. And just, you know, over the, the months and months that I've been listening to you, just putting out the good information. And um, yeah, your book, you know, I'm not being paid to promote this. I just sincerely encourage anyone if you've made it this long in this interview you're obviously the type that wants to see you know behind the curtain <laughs> to the wizard and just understanding you know the underpinnings of how and why markets move and always have um this is a great read we'll put a link in the description um yeah any other closing thoughts or no i'll well, just thank you obviously for your time thanks for having me on and you know really appreciate a good conversation and uh, you know like i said i think for me this is just you know pure education this is just trying to get you know a bit more of a bigger audience to see some simple logic you know that's all it comes down to for me that's what i'm looking for awesome yeah and i feel like with this conversation like i don't know that I, that there's more that i could say better and it's actually kind of liberating to me that i'm i'm not feeling like i need to come back to youtube and be posting you know daily weekly updates just for me personally it's almost freeing to be like ah you know here's the big picture Here's how I'm I'm able to just kind of anchor my participation in this space. And I hope for others that that actually got the download here, that it's likewise liberating, that you can turn off the noise and the influencers and all that hype and nonsense. And you yeah. can have a you can have a clear, sober picture and then make your own plan that's yours. <laughs> yeah. But well, I hope now I get a dollar for every time you use the phrase, nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll put a little Perfect. trademark on that one. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Well, again, thank you very much. Have a great evening, and yeah. I'll speak to you soon. You as well. Cheers, Liz. Thank you, Ryan. Bye. Bye.